Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject and on this episode we are going to look at a particularly unusual subject, a very weird and a very wonderful subject and that is a phantom werewolf. Yes, a phantom werewolf. Not just a phantom and not just a werewolf. (laughs) The two combined, a phantom werewolf. And I think this must be the first episode of a podcast ever to discuss a phantom werewolf. I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I think there can't be any others. Certainly, there can't be many others out there discussing a phantom werewolf. This is probably the first, probably the last as well. And also in a first for this podcast, this tale, this supposedly real life tale, which took place in Wales in the 19th century, comes courtesy of a researcher we have not looked at before. It's a researcher whose name, I think, might already be familiar to some listeners. And if it is familiar, I think it will bring a big smile to your face because they are one of the more colourful, shall we say, colourful investigators of such phenomena. And if the name isn't familiar... I would highly recommend having a quick look at them online at the end of this episode. And the reason they haven't featured before now, really, is that they're not known for their work in Wales. They are more famous for, well, in particular, they are famous for their work with vampires. And they are not limited to a location. They look all around the world at at vampires, at ghosts, at, well... Phantom werewolves, in this case. And that is a man called Montague Summers. Montague Summers, who really was a larger-than-life character, whose life story is probably just as interesting as the vampires he chased all over the world. And when it comes to describing his writing, his style of writing... Somebody on Wikipedia, which I try not to reference too often, but somebody on Wikipedia describes Montague Summers' style as idiosyncratic. And a quick internet search for the word idiosyncratic gives us similar words like distinctive, individual, characteristic, distinct, distinguishing and peculiar. And I think each or any of those words could sum up Montague Summers for me. But anyway, that's enough background and set in the scene. Let's crack on with this tale, which Summers recorded in the 1930s, but took place sometime before that in the 1880s. So late in the Victorian age, but Summers is a little bit hazy with some of the details. There's no specific year and there's no specific location, really. He doesn't tell us where this takes place exactly, but we do know it's in the northwest of Wales, towards the bottom of what I guess would be modern day Gwynedd. And if I had to guess, because we do get in the description that the events take place on the shores of a remote lake in the hills in this area, we're looking at the southern end of Snowdonia National Park, Kadar Idris, maybe. Wonderful, wonderful Kadar Idris, the huge mountain which is just steeped in myths and legends and Arthurian heroes and the Tullith Tig, the Welsh fairy folk, running all over the place. Or maybe it's not there at all, but it's certainly in and around this part of the world. But wherever it might be, let us now begin at the beginning. Summers tells us this tale comes courtesy of an Oxford professor. An Oxford professor, quite a high authority to get a tale of this kind from. This isn't some unreliable drunk person. Well, maybe they are. (laughs) Maybe they're an unreliable drunk Oxford professor. But anyway, it's an Oxford professor who was a very keen fisherman. And as a result, he'd taken a cottage for the summer 
on the shores of one of these remote lakes in the northwest of Wales. And it was there one balmy summer evening amongst the rolling Welsh hills that this professor, along with his wife, and a guest they were entertaining, so I assume there were three of them there amongst the hills. And one day, while the professor was wading out into the lake, he stumbled over an object which seemed upon examination to be the skull of a dog, but not just any old dog, because we are told it belonged to an un commonly large breed. So that's quite a big moment right at the start of this tale. There's no messing around straight in with it. He is wading in the water. He's on this idyllic fishing trip in the wilds of Wales and as he does so he stumbles across what looks like the skull of a large dog there in the waters where he was hoping to catch fish rather than dog skulls. Now, long-term listeners will know that this isn't the first time a dog skull has cropped up on a spooky story on this podcast way back, all the way back on episode three in a story about Swansea's most haunted house. There was, in fact, a dog's skull. But I won't say any more about that now because it'll spoil it if you haven't heard it. But if you would like to hear more tales about dog skulls and who wouldn't then check out episode three afterwards but back to this one he finds this dog skull while wading in the water and while most people might have just put it back where they found it he was we are told desirous to investigate further and it's lucky he did because otherwise that would be the end of our story and so he carries it back to the house where it was temporarily placed on a kitchen shelf. I bet his wife loved him for that one. Look look what I've brought home. Here's a skull. Here's a big dog skull on the kitchen shelf. And that evening, after his wife had been left alone for quite a while, she, quite surprisingly, with more than a little hint of fear, heard what Summers describes as a snuffling and scratching at the kitchen door which led into the yard. So she was home alone. She could hear something snuffling and scratching as if it was trying to get in through the kitchen door towards her. And she was naturally a little hesitant about opening the door because, to quote, lest she should be confronted with a fierce dog. Totally understandable. So rather than opening the door to see what was there or to let the dog in even, she did the opposite. She made sure the door was barred shut so there was no way that dog could get in. But that didn't quite solve the problem. And for the next bit, I think I'll quote Summers directly in his idiosyncratic way. He does such a lovely job of describing the scene. He tells us that as she moved, something drew her attention to the window. And there she saw glaring at her through the diamond panes, the head of a huge creature, half animal, half human. The cruel, panting jaws were gaping wide and showed keen white teeth. The great furry paws, yes, great furry paws, clasped the sill like hands. The red eyes gleamed hideously. It was the gaze of a man horribly intensive, horribly intelligent. All of which sounds like a scene from a horror film, but a real-life horror film. And I joked earlier, 
maybe she wouldn't be too happy about having this dog, this oversized dog skull, plonked on a shelf in the kitchen. Well, never mind that. She's going to be even less happy, I imagine. Terrified, even. From this strange humanoid dog-type creature, which is seemingly trying to enter the kitchen, or peering into the kitchen, at least. Anyway, but back to it. And it was about to get even more horrific, because half fainting with fear, she ran through to the front door and shot the bolt. So this is a good example of her thinking ahead in a way. Clearly, the back door was out of bounds now. There was some strange, hairy creature out there. And assuming that having been foiled by trying to enter the back way, it might come around the front and try the front door instead, she decided to lock it up securely. But a moment after, she heard heavy breathing outside and the latch rattled menacingly. There was something breathing heavily and it was trying to gain entry into the front door. Clearly, no door was safe from this creature. What had been an idyllic retreat was turning into quite the opposite quite quickly. And so we are now faced with a situation where the wife is locked safely, so she hopes, inside. This creature is lurking outside. And to continue the tale, let us turn back to Summers, who tells us that the minutes that followed were full of acutest suspense and now and again a low snarl would be heard at the door or window and a sound as though the creature were endeavoring to force its entrance i mean i i joke about it being like a horror film but i think you can picture it this house does seem to be under siege it's like it's like dog soldiers but with less soldiers i guess well there's no soldiers no soldiers at all instead we have one quite terrified while she's scared out of her wits wife but there is some light at the end of the tunnel there is some respite on the way because at last the voices of her husband and his friend came back from their ramble she could hear their voices out in the little garden and as they knocked, they found the door was unusually locked. It was locked fast. Now, of course, the whole house was locked up. And it took the last of the wife's strength to unbolt the door to let them in before we are told she swoons into a faint. Her ordeal, it would appear, is over. Or is it? Because when her senses returned, we are told... She found herself laid on the sofa with her anxious husband waiting for her to, well, to return to the land of the living, as it were, and to explain to him all that had happened while he was out for a short ramble. Now, she told him the story, and as she did so, the shades of night were falling, and it was time for them to prepare this house ready for any potential return of that dog-like creature. Or creatures, even. They had no idea how many of these, these things might potentially be out there. Now, we are told they secured the house thoroughly. I, I don't know exactly how, but I, I'm assuming everything was, was bolted up. Maybe they pushed furniture against the doors, shut the windows, but they were all barricaded in for the night. They extinguished the lamps and they sat up quietly, armed with stout sticks, which is a very Victorian way to protect yourselves, isn't it? Stout sticks, that's all we need. Well, stout sticks and a gun. And they did indeed have a gun. That's not just me joking. They had sticks and a gun. But anyway, now the hours passed slowly, we are told, that night until... When all was darkest and most lonely, it sounds almost like a work of fiction now, doesn't it? But we are told this is, this is real. When all was darkest and most lonely, the soft thud of cushioned paws was heard on the gravel outside and nails scratched at the kitchen window. 
I do love the way Summers sets the scene, and he, he probably is using a little bit of artistic license here, but nevertheless, the scene is set, and an unwanted guest is approaching that idyllic retreat. So, to recap that quickly, nothing happened for quite some time, but when the night reached its darkest point, it was then that they first heard footsteps followed by the scratching of nails. All very eerie, all very ominous. And once again, there is more to come. Things are really heating up now, and to their horror, in a stale, phosphorescent light, they saw the hideous mask of a wolf with the eyes of a man glaring through the glass, eyes that were red with hellish rage. What a description. Hellish rage. And these eyes of hellish rage spurred them into action. Snatching the gun, they rushed to the door, but it had seen their movement and was away in a moment. So, while this beast, whatever it might be, might look terrifying, it might have these eyes, these hellish red eyes, nevertheless, it knows when to beat a hasty retreat. Even a werewolf or potential werewolf, when it sees a gun, knows that is probably a good time to make a sharp exit. M maybe there's silver bullets in it, as far as he knows. I don't know, I don't know. But anyway, it was gone. Or was it? They decided to follow it outside. And as they issued from the house, a shadowy, undefined shape slipped through the open gate and in the stars, in the light of the stars above, they could just see a huge animal making towards the lake into which it disappeared silently. So silently and so smoothly, not even a ruffle was seen on the surface of the water. And so with that, without even a goodbye, this, this huge animal, this huge beast had seemingly vanished underwater and I am assuming did not reappear, did not need to surface for air or anything. It was gone. And as far as that night was concerned, the story ends there. The trail runs cold. It's not until early the next morning that the Oxford professor took the skull from the kitchen shelf. Yes, it was still sitting there. It had been there throughout. He took it from the shelf. And rowing a little way out from the shore, he wasn't just wading in now, he was rowing out into the depths of the water. He flung it as far as possible into the deeper part of the lake. The werewolf, as it is named now, I am assuming they all believed it was a werewolf. The werewolf, we are told, was never seen again. I think that should be the werewolf was never seen again by these particular people who presumably went back to Oxford or wherever they came from afterwards. But maybe the locals there knew a little bit more about this apparent werewolf. And maybe the locals today in Gwynedd could shed some light on it. And maybe they know a little bit more about this skull, which, while it isn't explicitly said in the story, I am assuming the professor thought it was the cause of the disturbance of raising this phantom werewolf, and by disposing of it, by hurling it into the water, he did indeed put an end to things. And in conclusion, Summers tells us, and this is one of the things I do love with Summers, while you have to take some of it with a pinch of salt, he was, let us not forget, an investigator. Ultimately, he wasn't a storyteller. He might have told good stories, but first and foremost, he was an investigator. He wasn't happy with just 
given you the story. He'd like to have opinions on what was going on. And he says, here we have a phantom werewolf whose power for evil and ability to materialize in some degree was seemingly energized by the recovery of the skull. And while I won't dwell on them too much in this episode now, because we are near in the end of this one, but I am sure werewolves will make a return in the future, Summers does point out that this might not be an isolated incident and gives us some examples of other similar apparent werewolf cases from the past. And these might shed some light on the tale we have just heard. And he says... There is the story of a werewolf which was seen by certain shepherds on lonelier hillsides at night about the middle of the 18th century. And there is a tale of a woman who was terribly scared one evening owing to the appearance of a great furry dog with the eyes of a man, which, so far as I can learn, must have been about a hundred years years ago. Now, he was writing this in the 1930s, so I'm assuming he means the 1830s. But he does say, both of these tales grow faint with the passing of time. And it would not be at all extraordinary if werewolfism, a wonderful word I don't think I've ever said aloud before, if werewolfism survived in the lonelier districts of Wales, even at the present day. So maybe, and this is just me thinking aloud, so maybe we're not dealing with the same werewolf over and over again, but if it is passed on in some way, maybe it's like the films where if a werewolf bites someone, maybe they can pass it on. Maybe it's a, a family thing, who knows? But if it is passed on, maybe there are parts of Wales where this werewolfism is still lingering, or was certainly lingering in the 1930s and might be still lingering now. And I think that is the perfect point to wrap up this tale. As Summers says himself, it would not be at all extraordinary if werewolfism survived in the lonelier districts of Wales at the present day. And off the top of my head, the most recent one I can think of was down Carmarthenshire Way just a few years ago when I was working in the local press. But that, as they say, is a story for another day. And as always, if you would like to make sure that you never miss a werewolf episode ever, <laughs> phantom or otherwise, please consider hitting the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever. Ever. And of course, if you have any thoughts, any comments on that tale, maybe, maybe you've seen this werewolf in Gwynedd or Carmarthenshire yourself. As always, it's lovely to hear from people and I'm quite easy to find on social media if you'd like to get in touch. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varion am grando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best. It's the beautiful. It's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, no star. No star.